right, welcome back to Player Base. I'm GR, and last time we were talking about the tiefling, and today we are talking about inspiration and feats in the options and ideas they are presenting in the one D&D playtest material. Let's start off with feats. What is it about feats that leads people to ignore them completely? Well, the first thing is, is that for 5th edition, and to a lesser extent, if I recall correctly, in 4th edition, in order to use a feat, you have to give up something else that's far more critical, like an ability score improvement or uh, a central power to the dynamic of the build that your character class is designed around or something of the nature like that. It's you know akin to uh, asking uh, someone uh, to uh, sign over the mortgage to their house in exchange for having like one car payment paid for them. The, you know, the exchange is not equivalent within the economy that they have set up, and there's not a meaningful choice there. There's one obviously better answer, and it's set up in the structure of power and better and worse, right? It's not like I have a whole bunch of colored pens here that I use for notation and uh, writing notes in my notebooks and things. And depending upon um, an idea or a, a differentiation between the other colors so it's easy to read that, that I'm writing down, I have a set of meaningful choices that I can make that are not necessarily better or worse than one another. They might serve more functionally in the use case, right? So I have like uh, a lavender pen and an azure pen and then like a, a sort of a darker blue maybe, you know, like a light navy almost. And they're relatively close in color. So if I'm writing with the navy, I might not use the azure pen afterwards. I might not even use the lavender one because it'll be harder to see. So there's a meaningful choice there, but they're all mechanically equivalent to one another. That's not how feats work in Dungeons and Dragons. Not only are you being given a choice that has uh, a reducible numeric advantage. But it's very clear that that numeric advantage has a given use case, and in order to get it, you have to give up something that is usually very obviously more widely applicable and more powerful. And that's not an interesting or a meaningful choice. And that's just in the dynamic, to say nothing of the types of feats that they're giving you. So, for instance, Crafter, right? I'm going to use this one as an example because it ties in to a whole bunch of anecdotes that I have. And I like using anecdotes, if you couldn't already tell. The Crafter mechanic for the, the feat that you, that you get for it gives you a couple of bonuses. It allows you, because you are a professional in your civilian life, you know, like a stonemason or a woodworker or something, that in the crafting of something, say like a statue or a banister or a sword, whatever it is you're doing, you can do it faster than the regular turnaround time by 20%. So you get a, a fifth faster turnaround time. And you also get 20% off any item that you would get in some kind of marketplace but only non-magical common items. And it, there are a couple of obvious glaring issues here to anyone who's played Dungeons & Dragons for more than three sessions. Let's start with the most obvious one, which is if you're playing D&D &D and any edition of D&D &D past second edition, really, and you're buying like weapons and armor, Past like the fourth session, you have no incentive to buy non-magical equipment. Because usually any like pedestrian weapon or tool that you could have, 
you usually have in your start out kit anyway. And if there's something that's particularly good, if it's better than a magical item that you will be getting within the course of play over several sessions, those things are few and far between. So already one of the things that you're getting from this is completely useless, right? Because none of the good stuff, you know, it's like you get a free drink from the bottom shelf. Uh, can I get the even the Jameson like 12 year? Nope, just the well. Like, that's not a very enticing deal, first of all. Then the, the second one is you get to do it a fifth faster. Not tw it's not half as long to do. It's a fifth uh, less time, right? It's not 50% off the time that it takes. It's 20%. It's not 80%. Like, it's not like a lot. You don't, it's not like a really quick turnaround. It's not an easily divisible turnaround or a noticeable one. It's like, if this would take someone five days, it takes you four days. If this would take someone five months, it takes you four months. Now, again, anybody who's actually played Dungeons and Dragons for or any role-playing game that involves human computing power for more than like 15 minutes will quickly come to realize what the issue here is. Because first of all, this requires that your dungeon master for both of these one-fifth cheaper and one-fifth faster have a complete comprehensive and interdisciplinary and like inter location and perhaps even international general market value which fluctuates on the price of all kinds of goods and services that is consistent and equivalent and also what the rough turnaround time on all of these goods are to manufacture like some kind of high fantasy union floor boss. Now as someone who has spent an entire weekend bedridden in the hospital working out what the pension rate for the high elven fantasy analog equivalent would be for a crossbow infantryman in early Song Dynasty like army service would be, and that's not a joke, although it is funny, I can tell you <laughs> Even the kind of people who like doing this are not going to be using this for two reasons. One of them is that in order to do that, you need not only a dungeon master who is capable and willing of keeping track of all of this really fine, detailed material, but an entire table full of people who are willing to do so also. And that, my friend, is like finding hen's teeth who can sing in harmony together on three different types of cockatiels, which are not hens. Funny story. That same group of four women uh, where I was Miranda, uh, one of the other women, was the person in question here. Uh, first game I had them play, it was uh, a dungeon delve. It was a spelunking adventure where they had to like traverse these very dangerous caverns as level one characters. I had them each measure out the weight in their packs so that each one had an even amount of weight distributed, even though they had an asymmetrical amount of things because they needed to have a certain amount of rope, a certain amount of pitons and hammers and rations and I made sure that everyone had their stuff ready to go. It took three quarters of an hour, 45 minutes at least, to get all that stuff ready. They go down into the underground, and you know they, they, they start going around the edge of this vast chasm. Five minutes into actual play, this woman, first person to take any action in the game, in the party, ever, takes off her pack and throws it into the ravine. So, I mean, there went that style of play. I quickly on the fly came up with something else that they actually cared about, and we did that, and they had a great time. But, like, the kind of people who want to keep track of those sorts of things, they are few and far between, and getting four or five of them in a room together for three sessions in a row, good luck, brother. Uh, 
I gotta say, I have games on my computer that can do stuff like that, right? Like I have all kinds of like homeless men rummaging simulators on Steam that I can play if I want to desperately worry about like making sure the resources in my pack as I'm traveling through Overland are well accustomed and appointed for. But most people are not into that. And the other aspect of this, which no one working on this seems to have thought of, is that any even moderately capable dungeon master, if you have a character who is a crafter, will be giving you these advantages for free already. But you don't have to write that in like that. It should just be a byline in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And this really goes to one of the principal limitations of the paradigm with which they're asking these questions to themselves, not even to the audience, which is how do we think of this material in a way that is useful? Because this, this is not useful. I give you another example because they have this issue with backgrounds. In that, you have heard anybody on YouTube or in blogs or in any media outside of WotC talking about character backgrounds in 5th edition. It is only in regards to what that particular background gives you in terms of character optimization for a particular build, right? For white room builds and things like that. And never again and nowhere else. It's just not used, right? If you want to be Frederick, the fireballing farmer, you know, you look at the farmer background and then you look at the background that gives you a plus one to fireball and you take that and then you write on the character sheet, Frederick, the fireballing farmer. People don't use it. It is in no way useful or geared towards engaging the player in the mechanics of the narrative. And that is the problem. And that goes to inspiration, which was, I got to say, I, inspiration was the most moving thing I've ever read in a Dungeons and Dragons piece of material ever. Because in an instant, Watsi had dispelled literally decades of uh, disappointment and bad faith and resentment and apprehension that I had for the game and for their tenure. Like, it had completely evaporated. And the reason for that is because in black and white print, they said, here is a tool to incorporate, engage the mechanics of the game with the actual role play that you are going to do. And I was like, Papa, finally. You know, it was just one brick in the house of understanding what and how people use the tools in a role playing game. And that was all they had. But it was a start, right? And the character sheet with ideals and flaws and, um, you know, and, and biases that they have that people write in once and never use, just like the character background, was a really great start. But I don't know, I guess like the factory that makes those bricks went out of business because they put down that one brick and never again in 10 years did they build on it. Not once. And, and now with the mentioning going out of the way to explain how inspiration doesn't stack, which was true before, or you can only use it in a certain area, it's like with the stone sense and the fire breath, it's the same thing. It's a, like a real misunderstanding of what these things are for because of the paradigm with which you're looking at them to solve a problem that you are then exacerbating. And really anybody in their situation would be struggling with the same thing. So if I sound like I'm picking on them, I, like I don't have their job. I'm just some schmuck on the internet. And, you know, it's a hard job. But it's a hard job because of this, right? Like the purpose of the inspiration mechanic is to incentivize with mechanical extrinsic rewards the intrinsic pleasure of playing the character. So a little quick. Intrinsic and extrinsic rewards, right? An intrinsic reward is something that 
you enjoy doing because the act itself is the goal, right? Like performatively functional intercourse or being really good at baking, right? You get an extrinsic reward with both of those things in um, relationships and for some people, children, for some people that's a lack of an extrinsic reward, um, or like the cookies or the cake or the bread that you're baking and then you get to eat it. That's the extrinsic reward. But the process is itself pleasurable. And you know, people who are good at those things enjoy doing them. Not everybody who's good at them enjoys doing them, but everyone who's really good at them enjoys doing them. And in a role-playing game, the win state of the game is both of those things. And the purpose of the mechanics is to give you a framework to make the world feel real, but the bonuses you get are within that phenomenology that simulates a reality to give you extrinsic rewards that tie into the intrinsic rewards. So like going back to the, you know, the issue with why would you play a human um, versus why you'd play an elf or a dwarf, the intrinsic reward of feeling like you're a smart elf with sword is attested for in the game in that you have mechanics which allow you to be an elf with a sword and do sword things pretty well and pretty elf-like, right? So you can be relatively effective with a sword and then feel like you're the elf with the sword. Like, that's the point, right? The reason players find it important to feel powerful with the things that you're giving them is so that they can feel like that character. The reason people want, they desperately desire the dragon breath weapon in the dragon man's, uh, the dragonborn character option to be powerful is so that he can feel like a dragon man's. Like that's why they're playing to begin with. They want to be the dragon man's. And if you're not giving them the extrinsic rewards to do so, they cannot enjoy the fruits of the intrinsic rewards. And inspiration is like that, you know, because so much of the way that the character building process is set up, it's set up explicitly and implicitly for character optimization. So when people complain about min-maxing and munchkinning, I mean, some of that, it, like, it's understandable. I'm not a big fan of it. I tend not to do it. Um, but it's not to say that I can't. And one of the, the real strengths of 5th edition over 4th edition in particular is that in 5th edition, you can build a character more than you could in 4th edition that has flaws and shortcomings and things that they're not good at while still being good enough at the fighty thing in order to be effective and useful in combat. And inspiration ties right into that because inspiration gives you an extrinsic reward for intrinsically playing the character. So instead of metagaming or, or realizing that, oh, I know that just judging by the interface uh, with the dungeon master that this count is very pompous and has a fragile ego and my character is very hot-headed, that if I say the right thing, I will get, you know, the four, you know, the four battalions of infantry that I need in order to cut off the cavalry. But if I do what my character probably would do, it's not going to go so well for me. And so if you just jump out and be like, no, you got to do this. Come on, don't be stupid. You know, and then you anger and insult the count and he throws you out or maybe, he, you know, he sends his guards after you. You get the little die on the side that gives you a plus six or something. Nerfing that is not going to go over well because on the one hand, that advantage isn't so much more powerful than all the other things that you're giving them in terms of character optimization. And on the other hand, the other hand again, like with the stone sense, if people are cheesing the role play mechanic in your rules, you should not be nerfing it. You should be looking in the other direction while you hand them a $5 bill and a Werther's original. And that's it. It's a role playing game, right? Like, it's not like an incredibly detailed, minutiae tactical strategy game. Like I, you know, I mentioned before, like I could just fire up Steam, play with my bro, like, and make shield walls with, um, you know, elves until the game crashes or play a Paradox Interactive game or play Dwarf Fortress or play 
any of the literally hundreds of Ang Ben and Rogue, like first edition D&D clones that are the basic genetic code of almost all video games now, right? I have avenues to do that kind of thing if I want to worry about those kinds of little details. And if almost all of your players are, you know, born on or after second edition came out, you really have no place worrying about whether or not like the legacy issues of, you know, workarounds to deal with antisocial like dungeon masters who are trying to kill their party needs to come into play. Like that stuff just is, it's not an issue anymore. And where it is, they already have those first edition books and they're happy to argue with each other already. You're not going to stop them. So, with that, I think that that part is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're good on that. And next, in the final, perhaps exciting conclusion of this series on the deep dive, we'll go over sort of takeaways and um, also, which we haven't touched on, some of the more tactical and strategic issues that WotC is dealing with, not only in terms of market share, but in terms of their own Red Queen scenario with regards to things like virtual tabletop and, um, you know, some minor apocalypses that are coming up that will render their entire business model and perhaps even, like, the whole structure of having a business model completely inert. And there's about 43 and a half months till then. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, Until then, like, comment, and subscribe. Share this with your friends and your acquaintances, and your frenemies, and your enemies, um, and your tough but fair teachers, and your unfair but they like you or they don't like you teachers, and really anybody else you can think of. Uh, yeah, I'm GR. Uh, thanks for being here at Player Base, where we ramble on tangentially, but poignantly, about the analysis of the mechanics of play, which is to say ludology. Thank you so much. Have a good day.